Okay, so now let's talk about phototransduction. So this means the process of turning a photon of light into a signal that the brain can interpret, meaning an action potential. So this happens, first of all, at uh, a protein called opsin. So these opsin proteins are inside the photoreceptors. So remember that the photoreceptors uh, have this kind of structure. They have a cell body with an inner, I mean the inner segment consists of the cell body with a nucleus and all the normal cell parts. But then the outer segment of both the rod and cone photoreceptors contains these little disks of membrane. And inside those disks, or attached to those disks, are these proteins called opsins. And the opsins uh, carry around with them a molecule called retinal. And Retinal is a molecule that when it's exposed to light in the visible spectrum, it converts from this form, what we call trans uh, cis retinal, to this form, which we call uh, trans retinal. And the trans retinal is the active form of this molecule, which means that it's going to activate the protein uh, that we call opsin. In rods, it's called rhodopsin. The, the cones have their own version of this protein, but uh, this is just the process in rods. So rhodopsin, when uh, it's in the dark, so this is a cell in the dark, the, op, the retinal is in its inactive form, therefore the rhodopsin is in its inactive form. And normally, or when the rhodopsin is active, it, it couples to this G protein called transducin. So in effect, rhodopsin is kind of like a G protein coupled receptor, uh, and retinal, actually trans retinal, is the ligand for that receptor. Um, so this G protein, um, we'll get to in a minute, but uh, it's inactive right now because the cell is dark, the rhodopsin is dark, but what's also happening is there are protein, uh, ion channel proteins in the membrane of the cells that are letting in sodium. These are basically just uh, channels that uh, stay open um, in the presence of this molecule right here called cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is kind of like cyclic AMP. It acts as a second messenger. Um, and so in the dark, cyclic GMP binds to the, uh, this basically CMGP gated sodium channel and lets sodium go through. When light hits this cell, it hits the rhodopsin, converts the uh, trans retinal into cis retinal. That activates this G protein. The G protein does what G proteins do. It kicks off its molecule of GDP, replaces it with a molecule of GTP, and then the G protein activates an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase takes cyclic GMP and turns it into just regular GMP. And that causes these sodium channels to close because now the sodium, I mean, now because the cyclic GMP concentration goes down very quickly. So what that means is in the dark, there is this large sodium current coming into the cell. You have sodium ions flowing into the cell through these cyclic GMP gated ion channels. So in the dark, the membrane potential of a photoreceptor is actually less negative than in the light. Uh, in effect, these cells are depolarized in the dark. And then in the light, the cyclic GMP concentration goes down, sodium channels close, and that means that there's less positive current coming into the cell, so the cell becomes more negative, which means the cell actually becomes hyperpolarized in the light. Um, so that means that effectively cells are active in the dark, meaning that they are releasing neurotransmitter in the dark. So this depolarization leads to the release of neurotransmitter, which in turn triggers the activation of bipolar cells. But in the dark, they become, I mean, in the light, they become inactive. So in the light, there's there's a hyperpolarized membrane, and these synaptic vesicles do not get released. So it's a little bit counterintuitive because you might think that a light detecting cell would become active in light and uh, become inactive in the dark, but it turns out to be backwards in the case of photoreceptors. Uh, it kind of makes sense when you think about the fact that at least during the daytime, most of your photoreceptors are being exposed to light most of the time. And so they actually spend more time uh, being exposed to their stimulus than, uh, than not, as opposed to a chemical receptor, for example, that's only going to encounter its stimulus uh, periodically. Uh, but that is how the photoreceptors convert 
light into a change in membrane potential, which then leads to a release of neurotransmitter. Uh, and then the two different types of photoreceptors we call rods and cones are very similar to each other. Uh, the main differences are the shape, so rods are rod-shaped, or at least the outer segment is rod-shaped, and the cones are cone-shaped. Uh, it also affects the way these membranous discs are embedded. So in the rods, the discs are inside the cell, whereas in the cones, they are continuous with the outer membrane, but basically they work the same. Um, the cones are smaller, therefore they have less surface area. That is important because um, they are packed more tightly at the fovea, and so you can fit more of them into that space. Um, but of course, the uh, probably most important difference between cones and photoreceptors is that cones have uh, cones exist in three different types. In each type of cone expresses a different kind of uh, opsin protein. So remember that opsin is the protein that uh, binds to red now and lets, uh, is activated by light. And so the wavelength of light uh, that activates the retina is dependent on the type of opsin that it's bound to. And so cones express three different kinds of opsins. Each one uh, absorbs light at a different wavelength. What we call blue light uh, corresponds to a wavelength of about 430 nanometers. And it turns out that blue cones express a version of opsin that absorbs light at that wavelength. Uh, Green cones express uh, an opsin that absorbs light about 530 nanometers, which is the light wavelength of light that we think of as green, and 560 nanometers is the wavelength of red light. And so red cones contain opsins that absorb wavelength at th or light at that wavelength. Um, and then rods ab absorb light somewhere in the middle. So, and there's only one type of rod. No, there are no differences between different rods. All of them absorb light at the same wavelength. So cones are responsible for detecting color. When you are seeing different wavelengths of light, uh, or seeing different colors, you are seeing different wavelengths of light. Um, now, of course, there are only three types of cones, but we can see way more than three types of colors. This is another example of population coding, because colors are represented in your eye by combinations of different cones being activated by a given wavelength of light. So for example, if you have uh, both red and blue cones being activated at the same time, you will perceive that as purple. Um, and in fact, all the different colors, yellow, uh, for example, is going to activate yellow. The wavelength that corresponds to yellow is somewhere in between yellow, uh, between green and blue, between green and blue, and so when yellow light hits the retina, it's going to partially activate both the blue and the green cones, and so you will see yellow. Um, now, the fact that each of these cones uh, has its own opsin protein means that if you are missing one of those opsin proteins, you will not be able to see that color. And in fact, this is what color blindness means. So if you are born with a mutation in one of the genes that encodes the protein for opsin, one of these uh, colored opsins, you won't be able to see that color. Uh, it turns out that two of these opsins show up on the X chromosome. So in fact, two of them are X-linked traits, which means that men tend to have them much more commonly than women because men only need one copy of the, the non-working uh, version of the gene in order to have color blindness. Um, now, the fact that there's only you only need three different wavelengths of light to produce all the colors we see is also why, if you've ever looked really closely at a computer monitor, um, actually it doesn't work as well on modern computer monitors because their resolution is so high, it's almost impossible to see this. But if you look at an older television or computer monitor when it's turned on and look very closely, in fact, if you have a mic, uh, magnifying glass, you'll be able to see that whatever image you're looking at is made up of just three colors, three lights, uh, red, blue, and green. And by mixing the brightness of those three lights, the, the television or the monitor creates kind of the illusion of color. Uh, same thing goes for print. So the reason, if you've ever opened up your printer, your inkjet printer, and you've seen there's usually only three kinds of pigment in there, those pigments, when mixed together, produced uh, all the other colors that you can see. But because your eye can only see three pigments, um, or only through three wavelengths, there's only a need for three pigments. So if we compare rods and cones, so again, other than being able to see color, there are some important difference, differences between these two types of cells. 
I mentioned already that rods have a higher sensitivity than cones, meaning that the amount of light necessary to activate a rod is lower than the amount of light necessary to activate a cone. And this uh, has some interesting consequences. We already said that uh, rods and cones are spread out differently. Rods are more spread out throughout the retina, whereas cones are more concentrated at the center, um, which means that the, your sensitivity to light is lower, actually, and the center of your retina versus the periphery. Uh, we already said that there's only one type of rod and three types of cones, one for each of those three wavelengths, red, green, and blue. Rods, partly because they're more sensitive, are also active in low light, which means that they are functional even in kind of dimly lit rooms. So we call them scotopic, whereas cones are active or able uh, tend to be more active in bright light. So we call them photopic. Um, it's pretty easy to demonstrate this to yourself. So because there are more cones in the center of your visual field than there are rods, it means that the sensitivity to light is higher in the peripheral retina than in the center because that's where uh, the rods are distributed around the periphery. The cones are more concentrated in the center. So you can uh, show this to yourself if you go outside on a clear night and try to look at the stars. Um, of course, you'll see stars of different brightnesses and pick out a star that's pretty low in brightness, uh, meaning that it's pretty dim. And uh, if you pick the right one, you'll find if you look directly at it, it will actually disappear because what's happening is the light hits the fovea of your retina, which again would be inactive because you're outside in the dark and uh, those are photopic uh, photoreceptors. Uh, but then if you look slightly to the side, the star will reappear. And that's because the light is not hitting your fovea, it's hitting the peripheral retina, which contains more rods and therefore has higher sensitivity. Um, so again, the, the differences in, in distribution of those two types of cells is what causes that to happen. Okay, next time we will talk about uh, retinal processing.